And here he comes kicking off the year with us. He looks awfully fresh for a guy that just got done with, I'm sure, a bunch of a bunch of New Year's parties for me, Sadie's here. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And I hope like hell it's a better 2022 than 2020. 2021, the first half kind of felt like a continuation or me to the dumpster fire we had in 2020. Yeah, it can only go up from here. So let's all hope for that. Well, the good news is you're going to help us with that. And I know you're a guy that's very good at helping people reframe the conversation, regroup, reboot, out of the gate in 2022, what's the biggest number one piece of advice you can give somebody to kick off a better kick-ass year? Well, I just want everybody listening to do this exercise with me right now. Let's just get into it. Here's my question for you. What is your rich life? I want an answer to it. And I already know what 90% of people are going to say to me. This is what they're saying. I want to do what I want, when I want. Okay, that's a good start. Now, let me ask a couple more questions to unpeel your real answer. What do you want? Now, this is where people go silent. Their eyes just glaze over. Because most of us spend our lives living in our email inbox and worrying about what we're going to eat for dinner on Friday night. And we never ask ourselves these questions. What is my rich life? People will say answers like this. I want to travel. Great. Where do you want to go? Ah, uh, some other country. No, 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 no. Here's the right answer. This is the kind of answer I want. I want somebody to say to me, I want to go to Bali. I want to fly on seat 3A. I want to take my parents, my children, my spouse, whoever. And this is where we're going to eat. And this is what we're going to do to make an extraordinarily memorable experience. That's a rich life. And so it's no surprise that so many of us set these generic, boring New Year's resolutions. And then we abandon them by January 15th. Because what, what is it? I want to be healthy. Yeah, okay. I want to breathe oxygen. That's not really motivating. Give me something else. Give me something specific. And suddenly you will find that you are much more inspired to accomplish it. Is that the science behind this for me? Is that the, the, it's the specificity that's going to make your engine go? This is more the art of it. The art of it is setting dreams that are things you actually want. Uh, and a rich life, you know, let me tell you what a rich life is. A rich life can be picking up your daughter from school every day at 3 p.m. That could be a rich life for you. A rich life could be buying a $1,500 coat. A rich life could be traveling two months a year. Money matters, of course. Money is a small but important part of a rich life. But if you ask people listening right now, what is your rich life? You'll often find that they haven't really thought about it. It's too intimidating, it's too scary, and deep down they don't believe they can achieve it. So they say words like travel and I wanna get healthier and you know I'd like to clean my garage out. All fine, you should probably clean your garage out. I've seen some of these garages, they're absolutely atrocious. <laughs> That's a don't look at mine, dude. Don't look at mine. Yeah, no judging. However, you know, when it comes to money, so much of it is negative. People think about money, they've been warned of all the things that can go wrong. Oh, you better increase your savings rate. Ooh, don't do this. And what I'm here to talk about is what you can do with your money. Why money should be a source of joy and adventure and memorability. That is much more inspiring and much more likely to cause a real change in your life. As, as you're talking, I'm thinking about back when I was a financial planner, it's been a long time, but I'd start every meeting with that because I didn't know how to help them if I didn't know where they were going. And the frustrating thing I would have was trying to get that same stuff out of them. And I'm wondering why that is. Why we do we not commit because we don't want to put ourselves on the hook? We don't want to give ourselves that um, uh, any pressure. I mean, why do we refuse to get specific about these goals? Because, uh, th man, it was a it was a wild day when somebody came in and the goals were actually specific. Rami. So, what was the one that you remember when somebody said what they want to do? I remember uh, a client of mine named Greg who told me, he goes, listen, I know everybody wants to travel. I'm a guy that spent my whole career traveling. I want my garden and here's what I want with my garden. And he told me exactly what he wanted. He said, I want to read six 
fiction books a year. I don't want nonfiction. I've been reading nonfiction my whole career to get my career together. I want to read six nonfiction books per year. And he had this whole thing, but he also committed because he was in a relationship and you and I'll talk about relationships later. He committed that he would take two vacations a year during his retirement, wherever his spouse wanted to go, because he knew that she hadn't traveled like he had. Yeah. And when he, but, dude, when he had that, I never saw that shit though. I never yeah. saw that ever. He's a superstar. You know, he's clearly thought about it. And I have to tell you, um, I speak to a lot of people who worry about money and they are obsessed with these $3 questions. Uh, should I buy the latte? Oh, should I get the appetizer? I'm like, I, I look at their numbers. I go, do you want to end up at 65 with $8 million in the bank obsessing over the price of iceberg lettuce? What kind of life is that? I think it's a tragedy to live a smaller life than you have to. Now, for everybody listening, especially the fire community, who's going to say, Ramit, oh, you just spend too much money. Life isn't about spending. Please listen. Rich does not have to mean spending more. It does not have to only mean luxury. Rich can mean many things. Rich, your money lens can determine what you value. So some people, well, most people in America, their only money lens is cost. How much does it cost? It's like being in a symphony and only having one instrument. It's not really a great symphony, okay? I want everybody to have multiple money lenses. Another money lens could be security. So where you live is safe or where you're going to dinner, there's uh, somebody to watch your car. Uh, it can be results. Yeah, sure, you can work out using YouTube videos or you can hire a personal trainer if you want better results. Uh, it can be pure delight. You know, I'm going to a restaurant, maybe it costs twice as much as the neighborhood restaurant, but it's truly delightful. They put a little smoke on the thing when it comes out and the fajitas are sizzling. That's cool. There are so many money lenses. And if you only restrict yourself to one, which is typically cost, it's no wonder that people don't inspire themselves with money because their entire worldview is how little can I pay? How much can I save? And listen, I love saving. I want you to invest aggressively. I talk about this, but I want to know what's the purpose of it. What are you doing with your money? It's so frustrating being in, in, in some of these online forums and you've been in these before too. I saw a guy in one forum saying, you know, my kids, uh, Gatorade, it's just too expensive, so I'm going to learn how to make my own. And don't get me wrong, no stink on that, Remy. If if your passion in life is making Gatorade, well, yeah, like, go for it, man. But I, I didn't get that picture. I got the picture that somebody's making this three dollar decision that you're talking about. Yeah, and also nobody can compete with the taste of lemon lime Gatorade. It's Come on, too good. Come on, that's the best Gatorade there is. Okay, uh, yes, I, I have to tell you a couple of examples that that I find very illuminating on our cultural perspective on money. So uh, I recently asked people, what would you do if you made like, $10 million? And do you know what over half of people responded with? They go, I would invest it. I would buy multifamily real estate. I go, you made $10 million. Hey, if you don't like the example, make it 20. Th this is what they do. They always go, is it post-tax, pre-tax? What's my tax rate? Yeah, I go, it's a in hypothetical man <laughs> come on you can't even dream okay so i put that aside yeah. i go whatever the number is it's a big number you you just got a lot of money what are you going to do with it and their first response is i'm going to save it i'm going to invest it i go man yes put put a little bit aside but you just made life-changing money in this scenario my real question is not what kind of multifamily real estate are you going to buy my question is, what are you going to do with your money? And if you can't answer that in a hypothetical scenario, then I guarantee you have no answer to what you're going to do with your own portfolio. Those people, this is what they're going to do. They're going to save. They're going to have an enviable savings rate, 30%, 40%. They're going to recalculate their Monte Carlo simulation 35 times a month. They're going to post about it on Fat Fire and other fire forums. And they're going to judge everybody who has less than a 32% savings rate because, oh my God, financial literacy is out of control in America. And then they're going to move to Florida, get some leathery skin and die. That's the life. That's it. And I say, where did you eat? Who did you take with you? What, did you go skydiving once or did you buy a nice shirt? Something. Did you donate generously? You know, create a rule for yourself. I'm only donating 30%. Sorry, I'm only tipping 30% or higher. 
What are you going to do with your money? And uh, the answers are very lackluster. Uh, I, I want to share one more example, Joe, because yeah, this one also drove me crazy. Bring it, because you're not at all passionate about this, so bring it. I, I want to finally see some passion. Yeah, I know. It's uh, So there's this guy uh, on a forum who is young. He's like 28 or 30 years old, and he has a huge net worth. It was something like uh, $12 million. Okay, Some guy sold a company or whatever. And his question was, where should I live to minimize taxes? Okay, now everybody just listen right now. First of all, I know that there are approximately three topics we can talk about where everyone's gonna get mad, and also everyone doesn't know what they're talking about. Number one is taxes. Number two is tipping. Number three is the price of weddings. I've written about them all. Just Google Ramit Sethi and any of those words. So this guy's $12 million. Do you understand how much a 30-year-old is going to have if they have $12 million at that age? What hundreds of millions of dollars. You physically cannot spend that kind of money. It's impossible. Okay. And he's optimizing for where he can minimize his taxes. Now, if the guy wants to live in Florida or Dallas, Texas, God bless. I love it. If you if that's your rich life, do it. I I, I love it. But I know it's not. I know that this person who could live in any city in the world, that's not his rich life because the first question he's asking is, how do I minimize my taxes? Now let's zoom out. I don't want to judge just this person for taxes, although I am. I want to talk about why do we think this way? And the answer is we only have one note that we all play. And that is how little can I pay? How little can I pay for shoes? How little can I pay for taxes? Oh my God. And you know, the same thing is how much is my savings rate, which is just an equivalent of how little can I pay for other things? Now, save, yes, invest aggressively, but that's just a tiny part of a rich life. And at a certain point, you got it dialed in. You got your formula. You use chapter five of my book. It's all automated. You don't even need to look at it. I spend less than an hour a month on my finances. A rich life is turning the chapter, turning the page and saying, what am I going to do with this? What kind of experiences am I going to create? That's so much more interesting than your 18 or 20% savings rate. You and I have, have uh, had past conversations for me where we've discussed both of our, um, uh, how we try to surround ourselves with the right people and how we have the right coaches and the right messaging coming in during the day. And I know from your appearance on other shows and other places, just how fanatical you are about making sure you set yourself up for that win. But if I'm trying to surround myself with those right people, those right messages in 2022, and I don't know where to start besides Stacking Benjamins and Ramit Sadi, you know, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk about your podcast in a minute. So let's say that you and I are off limits. How do you get that messaging? What's the framework you use? The first step is to acknowledge that there's a problem. Okay. And I spoke to a couple, a couple of days ago on my podcast and they were having relationship challenges and they just insulted each other a lot. Lots of subtle verbal digs. And they thought it was normal. They thought it was funny. And I asked them, what would your friends say uh, if I asked them about you? And they said, oh, they would say we're funny. Now, listening to them, I was like, that's not funny. It's not funny to verbally eviscerate your wife or your husband. And so later in the episode, I asked them, uh, do you have any couples that you admire? And they stopped short, just silent, speechless. And they both acknowledged, no. And so that was a moment where they finally acknowledged, oh my gosh, we don't have any couples or any people around us that we truly admire. Step one of acknowledging there might be a problem is really important because if you don't acknowledge you have a problem, then there's no why, there's no inspiration or drive to find other people. Let me put it this way. For everybody listening, take a quick mental inventory of the sites and the people you follow on social media and email. Do they inspire you? I don't mean do they tell you how important it is to save money. You already know that. You're probably already really good at that. Do they inspire you with their rich life? Is it that they have a date night twice a week? Is it that they're amazing parents? Is it that they're just beautifully stylish? Whatever. And if the answer is no, then now it's time to start getting on a piece of paper and saying, okay, who do I follow? And if I had to describe them in one word, 
what would it be? Be scientific about it. It's not, you know, just say, oh, these pers- these people are overly focused on X, or I kind of get it, I've moved past this. Now, on another column, step two is, what kind of people do I want to surround myself? Notice I'm not even at the point of recommending specific people to follow. That's way later. What do I want to follow? And you well, might... It, and these, by the way, Ramit, not to cut you off, but I'm also thinking these are phenomenal values-based conversations for couples to have, right? I mean, if you're planning with anybody this year, holy crap, is this a phenomenal uh, dinner with wine conversation? If it's Cheryl and I, that this is powerful stuff. Totally, totally. It's so much richer when you can bring in your loved ones to this conversation. And it's such a beautiful thing to be able to say, you know what? I, I realized that I think I need to make a change. And my wish, my dream would be that you come along with me and we do this as partners, but I really need your help. Oh my God, has your spouse or your partner ever heard you say that? Wow, that's so incredibly connective. So you start making a list of what you do want to surround yourself with. And I think this is where people feel ashamed. They might, you know, for me, I want to surround myself with beautiful things. I like beauty and I like simplicity. So I'm looking at, you know, like a Japanese monastery. I want pictures of that when I open up certain places that I follow. I want beautiful design, handmade pottery. Now, for a lot of people that feels shameful to say. It feels kind of frivolous. I don't care. That's what I want. For you, it might be, I want to uh, improve my fitness or I want to become more adventurous and spontaneous. Awesome. Now you've written these values down. And finally, and finally, and finally, step three is you can go out and seek some of those people out. That's how I would do it. That's awesome. And there's a reason, by the way, I meet with you here in mom's basement is because I dig shag carpeting. Like that is, that is it. I got this thing and we're making it happen three days a week. Speaking of that, if there is one thing people should think about to begin their year, Ramit finally has a podcast. What the hell took you so long to to get in this space, man? Well, uh, all of my friends, including you, told me, dude, you got to have a podcast. And I'm just a little slow. Uh, All my friends were like, "Uh, hey, you know podcasts have been out for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) And and you're joining us in the basement, at least, (laughs) you know? You know, the truth is I didn't have the winning idea. I really didn't. And I, I like to bide my time, almost like, you know, you're playing poker and checking until I know that I have the right idea. And that doesn't always serve me, but in this case, I knew what I didn't want to do. And I started to talk to couples, in part because my wife and I had such a challenging time bringing our finances together. Really hard, you know, and that that surprised me because I'm, Mr. I will teach you be rich. I thought, oh, this should be easy. No, first we had challenging conversations, signing a prenup, and then, when we got married and we started to organize our day-to-day finances month to month, that was challenging in a different way. And I found that uh, we were differing in values. I found that we use different terms to describe money. I found that the amounts were vastly different that we were discussing. And I, although it was the hardest thing we've done in our relationship to this point, I was like, if we are having these problems, then a lot of other couples are. Let me, I want to talk more about that point, but as a way of introducing this, I want to listen to just the first minute of the trailer for the I Will Teach You To Be Rich podcast. Let's listen in. Do you think you're cheap? I don't think I'm as bad as Greg. That's the second time they noticed you deflected to Greg. Would your family say that you are cheap? Yes. What about friends? Yes. By the way, their net worth is about $2 million. My name is Ramit Sethi. And, and that's how it begins. $2 million net worth, clearly, Ramit, not living their rich life. So common. So common for so many of us. Whether you have $2 million today or you are on track for having $2 million because of your investments, uh, everybody is taught how to save, but nobody teaches you how to spend. And it becomes incredibly complicated when you have a partner. So you yourself probably not 
especially sophisticated at money and money psychology. And then you have to bring in a partner who has totally different views, often brought by their parents. So you're fighting demons in your relationship. And I just, uh, I'll tell you this. I had never heard a couple from behind closed doors sharing real numbers about their spending and sharing their actual fights and challenges. That's what you get on the I Will Teach You Be Rich podcast. Well, and I was going to ask you just a little bit about that production because, you know, having done this for a few days, I know that getting those raw conversations is difficult, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how hard is it to find people and to make them feel comfortable to share this stuff? Because, you know, she's admitting that everybody thinks she's cheap and that's hard. It's hard to do number one for yourself. It's even harder to do with Ramit sitting in front of me and I got a microphone in my face. Yeah. Getting people to share openly was the hardest part of the podcast. And we had to learn how to do it. At first, people did not want to share. And we learned, my team and I worked on that really hard. Here's what I discovered. Um, first of all, almost every couple has differing opinions on money. So you don't have to feel alone. If anything, it's so affirming to hear other couples uh, and whether they are the same culture, whether they are um, LGBTQ, there's so many different couples and you realize, oh my gosh, we're not alone. That's one. Two is people will be surprisingly open if they believe you're trying to help. And when, I, when they get on the podcast, I'm not sitting here telling them, oh my God, you need to cut back on how much coffee you buy. That's not the podcast. The podcast is spending a lot of time finding the clues of why they behave that way with money. Yeah, you're not doing the Susie Orman uh, uh, or Dr. Phil. How's that working for you? It no. And before we say goodbye to everybody, if you've got one last word to make 2022 great, what do you think? It, it, what would that be? Joy. Experience joy. Engineer joy. Feel joy. Make this year your rich life. Mm -hmm. Ramit Sadie. Happy 2022, brother. I will link to, I will teach you to be rich. We'll, we'll also link to Ramit's website on our show notes page and in the 201, our newsletter. Uh, thanks a ton for kicking it off here in the basement. I really appreciate it. Always a blast. Thanks for having me.